As a mother, wife, and divorce attorney for over 15 years, experience has taught me a lot about how to deal with times of uncertainty, transition, and facing opportunities for growth. I'm happy you're joining me for this part of the journey. Dr. Susan Fletcher is a psychologist, author, and a forensic expert. She's often appointed by judges in cases to help high conflict families navigate the legal system. Even when there's not high conflict, she's appointed just to help the parents find resolution and answer basic questions that will be helpful for the court. We're lucky to have her here in North Texas, but her practice takes her all across the country. Today, she's here to talk with us about custody evaluations. What are they? When do you need one? And what do they mean? Dr. Fletcher, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. So tell us, what is a custody evaluation? Well, a custody evaluation is an assessment of family dynamics, specifically parent functioning, how the children are functioning, how the co-parent relationship works, um, their emotional stability. And it is typically done by a mental health expert to be able to give information to the courts. So when when are people needing a custody evaluation does that when does that come up so first of all it doesn't come up very often we hear about them a lot so we think it happens a lot but it's really a minority of high conflict cases but it comes up typically in a courtroom when there's a lot of discrepancy in what the parents are saying. And typically it's when judges don't really know what to think. They don't have the information that they need. In a child custody evaluation, one of the most important things the mental health expert is expected to do is verify data. So my opinion is that custody evaluations are more often uh, ordered for the parties when there's so much information that, that it's hard to understand what's really going on in the family and someone needs to do a thorough assessment of the emotional factors and be able to verify the data. That's really interesting. I think um, a lot of people who enter into a divorce or any kind of custody litigation, um, you know, they think we should just be able to get along, we should be able to make decisions, and they're surprised when their ex, the other co-parent, isn't agreeing with them. Um, and so what kind of data are you looking at in a custody evaluation? That's a great question because I would think that's a question anyone would have who is going to go through a custody evaluation. Um, I'll tell you, one of the pieces of data that's not relevant is a lot of information about the marriage and why the marriage ended. And let's also acknowledge Knowledge that many times an evaluation is ordered when the parties were never married. We see cases where they share a child and maybe didn't have an established relationship before the child was conceived and born. So what's important is to look at data that can support parent functioning, whether it's supporting your parent functioning or giving information that's verifiable about your co-parent's parent functioning. So things like um, incidents that have occurred, uh, there's a lot of he said, she said, and sometimes there isn't anything to verify the data. You know, now that we're doing, when we do custody evaluations, sometimes there's video of an actual event that occurred, but even then there's more questions to ask. So I think any data that can assist in understanding the parent functioning, the kind of relationship each parent has with the children is going to be valuable to a custody evaluator. One of the things I think that can be confusing for people are the roles of mental health professionals. So they're coming to you. You, you are a therapist. And you have done therapy and do therapy, um, but your role is different. Can you explain like how that all breaks down right. and the different roles that a mental health professional can play in a custody case? Right. I think you've hit on something really important that a lot of people, lay people going through litigation don't understand. You know, I'm a psychologist. I've had a clinical practice for over 25 years. It's amazing to me to be able to say that. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that for a long time, I didn't get involved in forensic cases. There wasn't a need. I was assisting families and helping. I'm gonna interrupt you there real quick because what is a forensic case? What's a forensic expert? Well, forensic expert, I think it's a great question because it's often misunderstood. So a forensic expert is someone who is a mental health person with additional training to understand the difference between a clinical practice and a forensic practice. So 
in asking that question, I think what most people need to understand is that not every mental health professional is forensically trained. And that's really key, is that just because you have an opinion as a mental health professional doesn't mean it's okay to give it or that it's ethical to give it in a courtroom environment. But also let's be fair, it's also not okay to give it in a therapy session. So for example, a lot of well-meaning mental health professionals may say to a parent who's involved in a custody evaluation or involved in litigation, you know, there hasn't been an order yet for an evaluation. They may say to children or to parents, let me talk to your attorney because I believe this child should live with this person. They have opinions about where the child should live or what should happen, but they may not have even met the other parent. They may not have ever talked to a teacher. They're really in a very narrow role, and that is to provide therapy to the family, whatever member of the family it is. And they step out of their role in a clinical practice, and that really hurts families, in my opinion because the families don't understand that. Kids feel like they were promised something and here's someone that I trust who has an opinion, but nobody listens to it. So the difference between someone who's clinically trained and forensically trained is that typically a forensically trained person is trained in both and they know the difference. The Texas Family Code doesn't allow anyone to give any recommendations about possession and access. And by the way, I like to use the term parenting time. I don't like to talk about kids as possessions and <laughs> access. So I'll use the term parenting time because it means the same thing. But you are not allowed as a mental health professional to give any recommendations about parenting time unless you've done a child custody evaluation. And unfortunately, there are clinicians who are clinically trained that don't understand that. And sometimes that gets them off a case. Sometimes a judge is going to replace them because um, that's inappropriate to do. And let's face it, there are attorneys and judges as well who also don't understand that it's yeah. not okay to ask the children's therapist, where do you think the children should right. be living, right? So I'm glad you said that as an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's well-meaning. I wanna believe it's well-meaning yeah. because um, people see kids and families in distress in these situations. And we wanna find ways to relieve that stress. And that's one of the worst ways to try to do it because what it does is it ends up costing the family more money. It wastes time. It also may interfere with the relationship where somebody's bonded with a mental health professional and they don't quite understand why now they have to change. I, I We're just diverting a little bit here, but I think this is so important. Why is it, I mean, this is a question that I've had, but why is it that a therapist who's just doing, I mean, I don't want to say just doing, but whose role is to do therapy with the family, why we shouldn't listen to their opinion? Well, they don't have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, they hear the narrative from the person that they're talking to, and we see this pretty frequently. As, a, as someone who is appointed to do child custody evaluations, it's very frustrating to me when I'm interviewing a therapist, which that's part of what an evaluator is expected to do and ask, you know, what are you observing? What do you know? And that therapist has never met one of the parents, but begins to tell me how that other parent is narcissistic or that other parent is abusive. And they really believe it, but it's based on one piece of information. And that's a narrative from the person they're treating. So I wanna be really clear. It doesn't automatically mean that person's lying when they're talking to their therapist about those things. But what it means is they're telling their narrative. And when a clinician takes that narrative as total truth without doing an evaluation, without ever meeting the other person, they're really doing the person they're treating a disservice because there's a lot of hypotheses, right? In the, in the families that are dealing with high conflict. And we have to look at all those hypotheses. And to be fair, a clinician's role providing therapy isn't really to look at the hypotheses. That's an evaluator's role. Whether, right. Yeah. So they're not a fact finder. They're not no. digging it under to see if the allegations being made are true, no. if your perception's distorted, how this is really impacting the kids, they're listening to you to help you reframe and, and think about things better. I think, you know, whatever, I mean, whatever the goals are in therapy, right. very different. And what you'll hear is uh, the phrase that they've been drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a derogatory way to look at it. I think it's a realistic way to look at it, but it's really not for outside people to evaluate about a clinician. Every clinician needs to do a gut check and make sure that they're not taking on the perception of their client 
totally because part of their job is to um, be able to help people question what they believe, no matter what it's about, even outside of litigation or a custody uh, situation. You know, someone who's single dating and thinks, you know, that uh, that that men, they have a certain belief about men. It's a therapist's job to, to get them to question their own hypotheses and to look at all sides, to take a 360 view. So a clinician who drinks the Kool-Aid and just believes that narrative as the truth and maybe even fuels it even more, it's really a, doing a disservice in therapy to that to that person they're seeing. It's really helpful to understand. <laughs> it's hard uh, for the person that's in therapy to understand because it feels like that person's an advocate and that really is a bad position for a therapist to take. All right, so when you're doing forensic work, you are questioning and digging and looking at data. What kinds of data are you yeah. looking at? Well, I think uh, the data is varied. And I will tell you um, personally, I know I'm a very curious person and most of the people that you and I know that do child custody evaluations or psychological evaluations, which I also do, the, the goal is to be curious, to question everything. Not because you think everybody's lying, but you also can't assume everybody's telling the truth. So verifiable data with credibility. So firsthand knowledge that people have. Um, I think it's really valuable for people to understand that when an evaluator is interviewing one of their friends, the friend lives in Canada, has never met your children, has never seen you in the presence of your children, but they're telling the evaluator what a great parent you are. That's secondhand information because it's based on what you're telling them or what they've seen on Facebook. That's not really accurate all the time most often, and so it's not verifiable. So it's secondhand data. So firsthand data, somebody's witnessed something, somebody experienced it, um, being able to have documents that support that firsthand data. So if uh, a parent says a child isn't doing well in school and fails every test on the Monday after they've been at the other parent's home, I can get the grade reports and sometimes I can talk to the teacher, but I can look at the data to see whether that's true or not. And so that's easy. <laughs> right. Um, talking about, uh, I, I have had cases where parents will tell me things the children have said. And then when I interview the kids, because that's part of doing a custody evaluation, they have a very different way of talking about the situation. They may say they really didn't care about something when parents said that they cried for three days about it. So you have to get a variety of data across data sources in order to look at what the trend is. So if one parent is saying something, but all the other data doesn't support that, then that's what's questionable, it can't be verified. And it suggests that maybe that parent's narrative isn't accurate. So paper stuff. So I mean things like grades. Um, sometimes it's videotapes. And I do want to say something about videotapes because everybody thinks they're gold. As an evaluator, I don't know what happens before the taping begins. I don't know what happens after. And typically one person knows they're being taped and the other one doesn't. So to me, I'm going to take all of that into consideration. That does not prove as much as people think it proves. And I'm also going to say that many times it proves the opposite. It might show that the person that provided the tape did some things that were inappropriate, like pumping the child for information. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so that's an example of data. Right. So we talk to collaterals, which are people who may be able to give firsthand knowledge or verified data. We do psychological testing if it's ordered by the court and only a psychologist can do that. Um, so I'm going to get testing done to see about their psychological functioning. Um, my observation of the person, that's data. Um, there are a lot of people who come in and they never blink and they hardly move. And I'm going to say in my report consistently, every time I met with them, they were very rigid, appealed, appeared that suggested guardedness. Mm -hmm. um, so my observation, I'm going to look at historical data. I'm going to look at um, information that uh, may have been provided by other mental health professionals, other evaluations that have been done. But again, no one piece of data determines anything. It's a lot of data. And I, and I also want to mention that as a litigant, I can appreciate that parties don't know what to give an evaluator. I always tell them, whether it's my evaluations or somebody else's, point the evaluator to the data. And if you give them a 2,000 page PDF of text messages, it sort of dilutes what, what you're trying to have come across point them to the data, and then it's the evaluator's role to ask questions and to ask more in order to understand the context of it. 
So is it helpful? I'm just going to get a nugget here for myself. Mm -hmm. Is it, should we just provide just the relevant text messages or does the context help, but then you highlight the, the texts that are the, the important ones to read? So I will say as an evaluator, my preference is to include a little bit more and then highlight because then I know what was important to that person and I can ask questions about it, but I also want to see stuff they may not have wanted to show me. Right. That's what I, I'm wondering. If, yes. If you're, if when you're doing an evaluation, you're not looking at what wasn't provided as, as significant as well. Right. And I also want to make sure people realize that when an evaluator gets information, they're going to ask the other party about it. So if somebody's going to show me pictures and they're going to represent that that was something that something occurred. And I'm gonna ask the other party in part of the evaluation, okay, I've been given these pictures, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond. Um, but I also wanna make it clear, child custody evaluations are not all about allegations. And that's a mistake I think a lot of evaluators make. They let people say, what are your top five allegations? And then they get the other person to respond. And there are times that it doesn't really tell us anything about parent functioning. We really need to look at parent functioning, their strengths and their weaknesses. If you tell me you take primary responsibility for the child's health care, I'm going to verify that with the pediatrician, the dentist, the orthodontist. I want to know who actually brought them, who makes the appointments. Really, who pays for it is not as relevant to me as an evaluator. I want to know who's doing the parent duties. Um, I'll ask the child, who typically takes responsibility for your orthodontist appointments? And I'm gonna get a lot of information that way. Just because you give me a shot record and you're the one that put your initials doesn't mean you're the one that provided all the healthcare. That's really interesting. I was gonna ask you about parent functioning. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big term. I mean, I don't, right. I will say as a parent, I don't on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis think, how am I functioning today as a parent? But um, what are you, I mean, what are you looking at? I mean, there are roles that people play. So like getting the healthcare, but what are some other things you're looking at in terms of parent functioning. So I'm going to ask the children if there's more than one child, I'll ask them together and I'll, I'll talk to them also alone and interview them. I'm going to ask things like, when you get in trouble at your dad's house, what happens? And when you get in trouble at your mom's house, what happens? What do you get in trouble for? How do they react? How do you know they're mad? What do you observe? What happens the next day? Um, I'm going to ask, when you have a problem with a girl, what if it's a boy who's a teenager, when you have a problem with a girl, you have, um, who do you go to? I'm going to ask when you have problems with school and schoolwork, who do you go to? And so that gives me a window into how the children perceive parent functioning without me asking who's the better parent. I'm not going to ask a child that. <laughs> I'm never going to ask that question. Um, and so I want to determine that not who's the better parent, but what roles do each of the parents play? How do the children view it? And then I'm going to look at the other verifiable data to support it. So one of, one of the common questions I think people come into custody litigation with is, you know, will my children be called into court? Are they going to testify? Are they going to be asked to make a decision between which parent? And um, a custody evaluation is, is a way for the children to actually have a voice in the process. Absolutely. Where they're not being called into court, hopefully. Right. <laughs> um, Talk to us about um, what you are hearing from children who are in the middle of high conflict custody yeah. litigation. So first of all, I'll tell you that I, I get really frustrated with parents and I don't mind saying that when they tell children that they get to choose. Um, that empowers children and it makes them believe that they do get to choose. And then if the decision is made and it isn't consistent with what they would have wanted, but it is in their best interest, kids get really upset. <laughs> they get really angry, understandably. So I think it's unfortunate that there are some parents who set kids up to say, when you're 12, you get to decide where you go. Just tell the judge. Um, because I don't know about you, but I have three children and they're all over 18 now. But I, at the age of 12, eight, nine, didn't give them the choice whether they went to school or not. It was right. my job as a parent to make, hold them accountable for the things they're expected to do. So what I hear from kids is that many times they have what we call loyalty binds. Okay. And a loyalty bind is something where you don't want to upset either person that you love. And so you're in a bind. And this is the way I, I will explain it as a therapist when I'm working with somebody in therapy. This is how I'll explain it to people is that, you know, when when you're 16 and your best friend 
doesn't like your other best friend. There are a lot of times, maybe around a birthday party that you may say, I wanna just avoid their conflict. So let's just don't even have a birthday party. That's how I'm gonna deal with it and try to control it because it makes me too nervous to have them both there. And it also makes me too nervous to not have somebody happy with me. So let's just avoid the whole thing. Children do that when they feel that they're in a loyalty bind with their parents who don't like each other but the children want, the child may still want both parents in their lives. And one of the ways that we see, you and I see it pretty frequently, is that kids will choose, not necessarily because that's what they wanna do, but it's a way to manage the anxiety they feel inside and to feel more emotionally secure to manage the conflict the parents are having. So they'll choose one over the other and maybe even align with one um, against the other as a way to try to create some kind of stability. And that is really damaging. And there are a lot of cases that I have where that's the dynamic because there's a lot of literature about it, a lot of things I know about it from what we know in research and other evaluators in our community know. So those are the hardest cases because- I, you, I've never heard the term loyalty bind before. That is such mm -hmm. an interesting term. And I'm sitting here thinking, through my own, own 16 year old self or other areas in life where those loyalty binds really do right. create anxiety. And I can only imagine for the kids. We, everyone has loyalty binds. Yeah. Somebody who's working for an organization, but really has an opportunity elsewhere feels a loyalty bind because they love their friends where they work. It's what they know. It's a risk to go the other place. They don't want to upset people. They don't want to burn bridges. And so they might sacrifice themselves and stay instead of taking the other job. That's a loyalty bind. Oh, we're gonna have to have a whole nother conversation <laughs> on this because I'm thinking medical care and all kinds oh, of things. I mean, yes. that's really, really interesting. You're used to hearing the word alienation when I we am, talk about yes. that dynamic. And many times I'm going to use the term resist refusal because you see the child may resist parenting time with the other parent. And, and that's what I wanna really talk about. Alienation is a hot term, mm -hmm. and understandably so, but that's an accusatory way to talk about the other parent when really the dynamic of a loyalty bind and resist refusal is about the family system. And one of the ways children, without even realizing it, are trying to create stability for themselves in a system that's not stable. So part of the job of a therapist working with a high conflict family is to assist in realigning the family so the child doesn't have so much power. And unfortunately, there are people in a divorce situation who appreciate giving power to the child because the child may be promoting their agenda about hating the other parent. Right. I was just thinking, you know, there are certainly times when um, I've seen, you know, parents come and they, they think it's a win for them that their child is aligning with them. And, uh, and rejecting the other parent. And I also have worked with the other clients who see how devastating it is that the child is rejecting the other parent and how sad that can be, right? Right. I mean, it is, children need both parents. Obviously there are limited circumstances where well, that can't happen. Correct, but, and I appreciate children need both parents. I prefer to say children benefit from both parents. I love that. And the reason is, is because they are, they see their parents in themselves. You know, we all we all do. Yeah. <laughs> and so if if one parent is really negative about the other parent, many times they internalize it. I know when I was a teenager, if my parents didn't like my music, it felt like if they didn't like my music, they didn't like me. If they didn't like the boy I was dating, they didn't like me. And so even though kids aren't verbalizing these things, they're giving themselves messages. So we have to be careful. The words we say to our children become their internal dialogue as adults. Wow, that's profound. <laughs> and also all worry, yeah. all worry is the misuse of imagination. So parents in high conflict situations can change the narrative a child has about the other parent, which can have a lot of um, debilitating effects for them in relationships. They may not trust themselves in relationships. They may not have good relationship skills. You know, it, it isn't the right thing to just avoid something that causes you stress. The right thing is, let's get the tools to learn how to manage it. Because we can't avoid everything in our lives that, that bring us stress. We can't avoid people that bring us stress. And so a lot of times 
I think people who are in high custody situations or high conflict situations where custody is an issue, they lose sight of that. Our job as parents, our own parent functioning, no matter what's going on in our families, is to assist our children with the toolbox they need as adults. I love that. I, I always say as a parent, there's that internal tension between wanting to protect my child wow. from anything bad happening, yet also needing to prepare them. And it's that, do I protect or do I prepare? And in the context of a divorce, when the family's falling apart, I, you know, I always tell my clients that this is an opportunity for you to prepare your children for how to deal with a stressful situation. So going back to one of your first questions, that's part of parent functioning. So as an evaluator, I'm looking for data that can help me know which parent or where are both parents preparing these their children for adulthood. I'm not just looking for the bad. I'm looking for the good because I want them to be able to build on those things. And I want that to be acknowledged. And I think that's part of what an evaluator's role is in doing an evaluation. You know, Certainly, um, I, I just want to ask you in terms of what you see. I, I do, I do have compassion and empathy for people who are entering into a high conflict custody situation. There's really nothing in life that prepares you for that. No. And so much of what we do instinctively, I think, it can be negative. Um, and my hope is that when people get the information, that they'll do differently. They don't know, right? What do you what do you see? I mean, do you find that really a lot of the negative things that parents do is because they just don't know? Or I mean, what are some of the causes of why parents are doing these things that are so hurtful for their children? Right. And again, that's part of what I'm expected to do is figure out, is this a reaction to what's going on or has this been what's been going on all along? Um, so uh, how do I know? Um, I ask a lot of questions. Um, evaluations are intrusive. I tell people at the very beginning, I'm going to be perceived as prickly. I'm going to be perceived as rude. And I don't apologize for that. As an evaluator, I'm not able to give empathy. I'm a data collector. So I prepare people in the beginning. I know this is stressful for you. I, I acknowledge that. And I want to set some expectations for you. You know, Mark Twain once said that all conflict is due to unmet expectations. So as an evaluator, I want to set expectations about what's expected of you so you can prepare and give me what I need. So I'm going to ask intrusive questions. I'm going to ask, I don't ask a lot of hypotheticals. I just don't do that. I don't know how to verify that. But I will ask, um, you know, tell me about your biggest struggle with your child. Tell me about, you know, the most recent time you had conflict. And if a parent is with your child, if a parent says, oh, we never argue. I'm going to dig a little deeper because it would be normal and typical for parents, especially teenagers, to have some arguments. So I'm looking for, are they giving me information where it's what I call impression management? And that doesn't help. Right. Because there is a bit of normalcy in conflict and the conflict isn't what I'm looking for. It's how do you manage it? How do you respond? Um, you know, do you do you micromanage your co-parent? Are you trying to manage your co-parent's parenting? Um, there's a term called gatekeeping too that I just want to mention. Um, and gatekeeping can be restrictive or facilitative. And what that basically means is, are you fostering a relationship for your child with the other parent? Or are you restrictive? Are you not telling the other parent about um, doctor's appointments? Are you not telling the other parent when your child thought she was pregnant? You know, I appreciate that these are sensitive subjects, but are you rest a restrictive gatekeeper keeper, or are you facilitative? And children benefit when their parents are facilitative. Because again, we're looking at that alignment. We're looking at that hierarchy. So I'm going to ask intrusive questions. I'm probably not looking for what you think I'm looking for. There is no perfect parent. First one to admit that. And I'm right there with you. <laughs> yes, it's really what it looks like later. And is your conflict at the expense of the relationship? Is your parenting at the expense of your child's development and handicapping your child as they move on into adulthood? That's really what I'm looking for. And I think it's important for people that are ordered to go through a custody evaluation to realize they're being evaluated. You're not just a source to give me data about your co-parent. 
And if all you want to do is talk about what your co-parent does wrong, that is a reflection on your functioning. So it's important to go into it knowing, okay, I've made some mistakes, but here are some things I'm doing differently. I'm open to feedback and I'm looking for the data to verify that from your therapist, you know, from, from your actions. Because really you are getting a, pres- a professional opinion about your parenting strengths, but also those areas of growth, which we all have. Right. And really, you know, I, I think it's so important. I understand and I, I really want people who are facing custody litigation to know and understand that how how things happen in the divorce and how, how life is going to go on after the divorce will impact your children for generations. And that's what you're talking about. They're going to go on and have relationships and those internal voices that are happening. And look, none of us do this perfectly. So look at the evaluation as an opportunity to grow as a parent and to show up in your unique family situation as a better parent. Right. And I appreciate that's hard for people because it's intrusive. It's ordered. Your kids are going to have to answer answer questions that a stranger is asking. So I do appreciate that's hard to do. That's what I would want for everyone. And I just also want to mention that not everybody can do a child custody evaluation. And I appreciate that parties don't understand that. And a mom and dad going through a divorce don't understand that. They may want the therapist that's been seeing the kids for three years to do it. We can't play a dual role. And a dual role means there's a scope of your role. There's a reason why people I've seen in therapy I don't do their evaluations. There's a reason why if I've done someone's evaluation, I'm not going to be the person seeing you in therapy. And people don't understand that. And and sometimes I'm sure you hear it too. People will say, yeah, but Dr. Fletcher did our evaluation. She knows us so well. She hit the nail on the head. Sometimes they say she missed every (laughs) mark. I don't agree with anything she said. And so um, they may think, because I know the whole story, because I did the evaluation, I met everybody, talked to grandparents, all those things, that I'm the best person to work with them. And I'm not because my role has ended and forever that is my role. I can never play another role. And that's hard to understand, but it's in a family's best interest that we stick to our roles. So you and I both know what custody evaluations look like. (laughs) There's a section at the end of the evaluation after you've collected all the data where you are making recommendations. What kind of recommendations do you make? Okay. And right before that, you and I know the opinions are given and the conclusion about the information. I know, I know that attorneys go to the very end of the report. (laughs) And my reports are 70 pages long. They're looking at page 55 and forward, and then they go back. I know it. And (laughs) and so I try to be as clear as I can in that portion. Some of the recommendations that are made are recommendations for therapy. And I, as an evaluator, am going to give specific goals for the therapist to consider. I'm not going to micromanage the therapist, but I'm going to say, you know, work on the child being being able to differentiate their feelings from the feelings they see their, uh, their parents express. Um, So I'm going to give definite goals because that helps a therapist know, okay, that's valuable. Um, I'm going to make recommendations about possibly first right of refusal, which you and I understand means if during your parenting time you are not able to care for your children because of a work trip or something else or hospitalization, there are many reasons why, that the other parent gets the first option to be able to take on that role of taking care of the children during that time. I'm going to say I don't recommend it a lot. It just adds even more conflict about, well, he was gone three hours or she was gone overnight, but the flight came in at 12.05, you know? Right. So it just adds more conflict, as my experience in the research shows that too. So I might even say in there, I don't recommend first right of refusal because it appears from the data that it may be conflict inducing. Um, and, and, you know, we deal with that. Um, I might make recommendations about using some kind of software that's available to families to communicate. There's something called Our Family Wizard, which I do like Our Family Wizard, but there's others that are out there that is a platform for um, for people to communicate and attach documents like bills. So it's a communication system for parents that can be entered into court um, and it also can be monitored. As an evaluator, if somebody's already using Our Family Wizard, 
I am going to ask for access, not to interact on there, but to observe. And sometimes I'm seeing what your interaction with your co-parent <laughs> looked like in 2016. Yeah. You know, if it was a modification, the divorce is over, there's already been a period of time with two homes, but somebody's filing for something new. Um, I'm also uh, many times going to recommend that, um, that they change the therapist that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to do that. It doesn't make me a lot of friends if I'm gonna be critical of the professional. So I'm going to say it in a professional way that I believe possibly that this therapist may have um, done the best they can at this point and we need somebody new with these skills or to work on these things. Um, and again, I will give goals. There are times I'm gonna recommend a parent facilitator. A parent facilitator is somebody who is specifically trained to be a parent facilitator. It's a title, not an adjective. And so um, I may recommend a parent facilitator to help the parents learn how to establish their co-parenting relationship with two households, not redo their marital therapy or the reason their <laughs> marriage ended. Right. And one person may have that agenda, but a parent facilitator is going to assist the parents in their decision making, working together. Can they both be there during pictures of home, you know, for the homecoming dance? Um, how do you handle introducing a new partner to your children? So the, they're working on the co-parenting relationship. So parent facilitator doesn't meet with the children. Most often they don't. So I might recommend that if I feel that it would be helpful. And again, I'll give some goals. Um, I also put a recommendation every single one of my court ordered psychological evaluations and child custody evaluations when I'm appointed to be the evaluator. I always put a paragraph in that says, this report should not be shown to the children. Mm. And showing it to the children is not in their best interest. Oh, that's so important. It that's is a so big old important. fat paragraph in there. Yeah. And the reason is, is because sometimes even after these evaluations are done, one of the parents might have an agenda and they might give it to a child and it's information the child should not have. I also caution people from giving a copy to family members or significant others, because once you hand it to someone, you don't have any control over what happens no. to it. I've had cases where somebody has made copies and handed them out to the soccer team parents. Yeah. And, um, and that's just wrong. That hurts kids. So it's not a weapon and it's also not something that children should read and don't just accidentally leave it up on your computer. Right. I mean, it is it, it is very intimate, detailed information. I mean, you're really looking not just at the skeletons in the closet, but all the under every rock and and every crevice and right. corner. So there's one other recommendation that I make a lot, and that is that children are allowed to take their possessions from one house to another house. Um, sometimes parents get short sighted in these situations and they say, I bought that iPad, you can't take it to your father's or I bought that coat, you can't take it to your mother's. Okay, it's the child's coat, it's the child's iPad. And so when you start marginalizing children and what they have at one house versus another, that really is disruptive to their emotional well being. Sometimes people do it with animals. Um, sometimes people do it with friends. That friend can't come over here, but you can have sleepovers over there. If you want to do that, you have to do that at your father's. So I will put many times in there that they are uh, that I want the court to consider ordering that children should not be restricted from what they take from one house to the other, which brings up a point. Something you haven't asked me yet, but I know is a very common question. So do you is, do I get to decide as an evaluator? what the parenting schedule is going to be and what the right. outcome is. And I'm going to tell you as a psychologist, I'm a psychologist. I'm not an attorney. I am going to give opinions, conclusions, and recommendations based on the data. I consider myself a guest in the courtroom. That's not my office. I am there if I'm subpoenaed by an attorney to provide testimony in an appearance in court about what my findings were and what led me to make certain decisions. So it's entered into the record. But in no way does any child custody evaluator make the ultimate decision for a family. We make recommendations. And many times the court will follow the evaluator's recommendations, especially if they show their work. It's like long division is the way I always talk about it, is that um, we have to show our work. We don't just come up with the answer. So some evaluations, it might be over hundred pages. My report's gonna be long. Um, the other thing is if you use the analogy, 
An evaluator shouldn't skip stones across the surface of things. We should be scuba divers. We should put on our equipment, do a deep, deep dive, get lots of information, go deep to find that information. When we are a scuba diver, when we are uh, verifying data, it is more likely that the judge or a jury, because in Texas, juries can help decide family law right. matters, that um, they are the ultimate decision makers. I, I never consider that I am. And there are times judges deviate from what my recommendations were, and that's, that's their job. I don't ever get upset about that. I wonder what I may, may need to do differently to do a deep dive and provide more data and verify in the future. But right. it's not my decision. There's, um, I mean, and this gets sort of technical and we don't, we don't need to go deep into this, but really the judge is the decision maker yes. of what is in the best interest of the children is the question. And they're gonna base their decision on all the evidence that's presented in the courtroom. You are, your testimony is evidence. So yes. when we call in the expert, that is that is one piece of the evidence that the court will be looking at. Now, you've done the deep dive, you've gone in and collected all the data, um, and that forms the basis of your opinion. But, you know, people often think I'm gonna bring in all of this data into the courtroom as evidence, and there's just not time. We have such limited time. And I think it's gonna get worse. There's gonna be even more in I think you're time. exactly right. How much time do you spend typically in a custody evaluation? <laughs> more than I ever bill for. Yeah. And I don't apologize for that, and I'm not upset about that. You know, these are families. Um, I have an opportunity to provide information for good decisions to be made. And so I don't take that lightly. This is not a power trip for me. This is part of my training in graduate school as a psychologist. This is um, people's lives. And if you've gotten to a point in your litigation that a judge orders a custody evaluation, there's a reason because it's not every case, it's a minority of cases, but they are the ugliest cases with the most accusations. And so, um, you know, it is uh, really important that we continue to get training, those that do this work, that we have good self-care, um, that we support each other, that we recognize this is a transparent process. I know in cross-examination, I am going to be prosecuted. I don't know what that <laughs> word is. I'm going to get, um, you know, they're going to try to uh, question my credibility and whether I was biased. So my procedures as a custody evaluation, and you know this, are really well defined. I don't let litigants email me. They are very well defined. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're called really good boundaries. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you the reason I do that is because I'm preparing for cross-examination. I better be able to defend whatever my opinions, conclusions, and recommendations are. And so I tell people what the rules are. And the reason is, is because it benefits families. Okay. I don't want to align because bias, we all don't, we all have bias. Sure. And we don't know what it is. So I have procedures in place to be able to protect against the possibility of bias increasing. And I do that because I want to be neutral. I'm appointed to be a neutral party and provide information to the courts. So it's important that any evaluator not have side conversations. And that's why the training for evaluators is so important. Absolutely. And you know, I will often hear back from my clients who are in the middle of a custody evaluation about how prickly the custody evaluator <laughs> was because it is a very different relationship and you're not developing the normal human connections. You're talking allowed. about where you're from and all the things you nope. have in common and all those wonderful things about human relationships. You don't get to do that. Nope. Nope. Our purpose. Right. Because I don't want to enter the system. Yeah. I don't want to become part of the system. I also want to take responsibility if somebody perceives that I am biased or I gave somebody greater access. This is a balanced process. And so I am always checking to make sure that my process is balanced. I'm always checking to make sure that I got the information I needed. You know, I'm an evaluator and many of my friends that do this are the same way, that if somebody tells me something happens when the child gets off the bus with the other parent, but I know they haven't seen it firsthand, I have been known to park my car at the end of somebody's street without them knowing when the bus is dropping that child off so I can observe it for myself. And I will call the school district and find out the bus schedule. They'll give it to anybody. I don't have to tell anybody's name. I don't have to say who I am. And I will sit at the end of the street because I want to see it with my own two eyes. And, um, and so I'm going to go the extra mile. 
you know, I'm going to ask for additional collaterals from collaterals sometimes. And I come back because it feels like punishment, right? And so many people are in the process feel like this is just a penance for past sins or what. I mean, it feels like they're, you're out to get them. Absolutely. But really, you're out to look at what's best for the children. And I think if we just step back for a minute and realize that the evaluation process is to help the children. Right. And you're going to have to hear things you don't want to hear. Right. And that's hard. Right. right. And you and I and many other attorneys and psychologists hope that when the evaluation is done and the reports are submitted to the attorneys, they're not given to the parties. When I turn in that report, I'm turning one in this week and I'll turn it in and give it to the attorneys and then I'm done. OK, then it's crickets for me. But in the other part of the world, there's a whole lot of information and dialogue going on. I hope they settle because of my report. Yeah. I really do. I hope it's as thorough as it can be to help people come to agreements and not have to go through the trial process. But I also recognize that's not up to me. My right, hands are right. done. I'm done with what I'm doing. So I take that very seriously. And I believe most of the evaluators in there, our community there do are too good and important recommendations in the evaluation. And if people will read it with an eye towards how can I show up as a better parent for our children during this time, right? then they're going to get a lot of information out of it. Yep. I have a blog on my website. It's FletcherPhD.com. And you can get to the blog. Just click on the word blog on the homepage. And I've blogged since 2007. Okay. There's a lot of information on there, but there is one blog post and I blog pretty frequently and, but people can find this. A girl uh, that I don't know um, is a blogger and she blogged about how children of divorce love differently. Mm. And what her experience is in trusting, and it doesn't appear that her family was in a high conflict situation. There were a lot of accusations back and forth and things like that, but she does a beautiful job of helping parents see what these dynamics may look like later in your child when they're trying to form their own relationships. They're trying to develop themselves as parents. And it talks about the suspiciousness. It talks about the um, difficulty in communication. And so, you know, as a therapist, not as an evaluator, when um, families are dealing with all of this, I will say to the kids, I want you to be able to leave me at the door when you, when you graduate from high school. I want you to leave me <laughs> far behind when you get married on your wedding day. I want you not to need somebody in my profession. That's my job, is to help you prepare despite all these things that have happened um, so that you can have the best and healthiest relationships possible. If parents can take that approach themselves and use a custody evaluation, especially the report and the information that's in there with that goal in mind, then I think that the evaluation is worth it. And it's, and, um, and I think it benefits children. And I keep that in mind when I'm writing them. So when you ask how much time do I spend I mean, you know, I, I don't skim stones across the top of the water. Um, I'm going to do a deep dive because I want them to only go through it once. And I don't want to leave as much. I don't want to leave a lot unturned. I will. I'm human. I always will. Because at a certain point, you got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to look at the relevant information and give everybody what they need to be able to hopefully settle and not have to go to trial. But if I'm subpoenaed, I will show up because that's part of my job um, to answer questions on the stand. But I want families to be better for it. But that's not up to me. That's up to the parents. Absolutely. This has been so incredibly helpful. And we are going to include links to your website where people can go find the blog. I'm going to go check it out myself. And of course, we would love if you've enjoyed uh, today's discussion to make sure you subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube or subscribe through Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Thanks for having me.